Creamer Media's Mining Weekly is speaking to Trevor Raymond, the Director of Research for the World Platinum Investment Council. Trevor, it's pleasing to see the platinum price rise through the $1,000 an ounce mark. To what extent has investment played a role in this? Yes, it is extremely pleasing to see and uh, you know, something we've been talking about for quite some time. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the publication of the 1.2 million ounce deficit that we put out on the 18th of November was certainly a surprise to some in the market. Um, but what we think is that during 2020, COVID had a big role in a blowout that happened on the NYMEX Futures Exchange. And most of the people that uh, look at short-term news flow and take an investment position based on that news flow typically use futures uh, in, in the NYMEX uh, Platinum Futures Market. Now, those investors were staying away because we had this distortion that happened uh, because of COVID. Fortunately, what's happened is that a lot of 50-ounce uh, platinum bars, good delivery bars, have been manufactured, mainly in Switzerland. They've been delivered into New York, and liquidity is back in that market. Uh, those spreads have come down completely. So what we're seeing is that people are looking at this platinum market and taking positions on the futures, and, and that certainly has moved the price up. Uh, you ask whether investment demand has been behind that. Well, interestingly, you know, investment demand was extremely strong this year, and certainly is why we have this uh, very large deficit. But I think what investors in that ETF market are looking at is they're saying that there's been um, you know, a very uh, sharp reduction in South African supply, less of a reduction in demand, uh, and strong investment demand that's likely to continue. Precious metals are still in strong demand. And certainly people are joining the dots between the hydrogen economy and platinum, and that's seen a lot more investor demand come in. So we think this is likely to continue uh, you know, to be strong during 2021. And certainly good investment demand is always good uh, to have that view reflected in the price. And Trevor, do you think that the platinum group metals could be entering a super cycle of being stronger for longer? So I love the, uh, I love the words that you use, Martin. Um, but certainly, you know, we've had palladium and rhodium being in uh, significant deficit and significant demand over the last few years, and those prices are incredibly strong. Uh, we know that the balancing between these PGM markets has happened over a very long time, and typically that balancing would be at the moment platinum substituting for palladium in, in order catalysts. Whether it's a super cycle, I think certainly the demand growth potential for all three of these main PGMs, uh, as well as the minor PGMs, these minor PGMs are being used more and more in all sorts of industrial applications. So I think stronger for longer is, is most certainly, uh, you know, the demand situation. So I think the, you know, the markets are, are well aware of the, of the overall shortage of, of PGMs in aggregate. And Trevor, what I regard as a very important Platinum Group Metal Summit took place in China on Friday. The high technology Suzhou Industrial Development Zone in, in China took part in what could be a powerful driver, in my view, for Platinum Group Metals. Can you provide some insight into the potential benefits of that important event? You'll recall we opened our office in Shanghai in uh, 2017. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there's no listed ETF in China, so it's a little harder for investors to, to take positions. And we work very hard to do two things. One is to try and get more uh, manufacturers to produce bars for sale to the retail market, and that certainly is happening. Um, but then a lot of uh, investors in China um, are extremely interested in platinum. There was a very strong brand awareness because of jewelry being in that market for many, many years. Um, but what we've had to do is to increase the awareness uh, of platinum. Uh, many people don't know about platinum. And what we do know is that platinum is a very strong industrial metal as well as a precious metal. So what we've tried to do in China is to get the various parties together uh, that are involved in the platinum supply chain. And that includes you know, the large manufacturers like BASF, Johnson Matthew and Umicor, who all manufacture uh, auto catalysts in China. Um, and for them to talk to some of the industrial users, people that use uh, platinum, for example, to make nitric acid from platinum gauze, uh, all sorts of uh, industrial catalysts. And, uh, and the other uh, big growth uh, area is the hydrogen economy and fuel cells. So what we've managed to do, and, and this has been uh, an event that we held last year, is to try to get as many participants in the platinum value chain to get to a forum and talk to each other. And we're kind of uh, unique in our ability to be positioned that we don't really mind who uses platinum and what they make of it. We also don't mind what investment products investors hold. Um, but we're quite keen that everybody has more information um, and a good investment 
segment is also good for industrial use. Uh, so by joining those people together, uh, we certainly are able to increase uh, awareness. And the conference was very well attended last year. We thought there were over 300 people uh, that attended last year, and I think about 6,000 online. And this year we had uh, we had over 400 people uh, at the conference and uh, well uh, into the tens of thousands of people that were online. So extremely well attended, uh, well, uh, you know, good participants. And we think we've, we've been able to further increase the, uh, the awareness of platinum in China. And remember, there's many um, citizens in China that are now saving for their own retirement. And they've known platinum jewelry for 30 years. Uh, they know it's a good brand. They know it's better than gold in the jewelry segment. So they're quite comfortable to put that platinum into their uh, retirement savings. So we see this as a long-term growth area for platinum investment demand, Martin. And so a good platform has been reinforced by this 2020 International PGM Summit. Could this become an annual event now? Yes, certainly. We trialled it last year very successfully. We've done it this year and we, we've had very good feedback from the industry that it's an unusual um, forum that, you know, the World Platinum Investment Council can get together a massive industrial players like, you know, BASF and uh, use uh, a, a city like Suzhou to showcase platinum. Uh, and, you know, many people travelled uh, far and wide to attend the conference. So we think it's a good conference, not just for investment demand, but for greater awareness and also for the industrial participants uh, to consider Platinum's investment potential and the benefit that uh, a good investment segment brings uh, to industrial use. And I thought the theme was great. You know, you had this new energy, new material, new ecology. It was a wonderful theme for a wonderful group of Platinum metals. What role could PGMs play in all that? So I think the, you know, the, the standout connection really is the hydrogen economy, um, and that bridges pretty much all the gaps. Uh, what we've seen with COVID is that uh, you know, many governments are, are stretched for funding and what they're doing is making um, policy changes, uh, long-term sustainable policy changes. And this has heightened the importance of hydrogen as a fuel. And certainly in China, um, you know, one thing that, that might get missed is that you know, China already had an air quality issue. And what they did was that they converted most of their municipal bus fleets and their municipal uh, vehicles into battery electric vehicles. So if you go into a city like Beijing or Shanghai, nearly all the buses and municipal vehicles are battery vehicles. And they did that mainly for air quality and it's worked very well for them. So they've already got a very well-established infrastructure to charge batteries and run battery electric uh, uh, trucks. Um, but what China's doing is it's saying that in the north of China, it's very cold. And we know battery electric vehicles don't work well in the cold at all. The north of China also has a lot of solar energy and wind energy. And if they can use that solar and wind, uh, it makes the fuel cell trucks and fuel cell cars very appealing. So what they're doing right now is they're converting nearly that entire fleet in, uh, in their cities from battery electric vehicles to fuel cell vehicles. And the reason they're doing this is to give their fuel cell industry critical mass in order to roll fuel cells out into northern China. And that's a really big demand for platinum and a great long-term future uh, for this metal. So I think that uh, you know, is, a, is a good long-term story and what that's doing is driving more investors to consider platinum. And when investors consider platinum, they come in and they see the fundamentals. They see, for example, directly in China, uh, we know the jewelry demand in China has gone down almost every year for seven years. Uh, and it's going to pick up in 2021. It's going up by 13%. Um, and this is you know, for a whole bunch of reasons, mainly that the gold price went up and gold jewelry is quite expensive. And the retailers and manufacturers bought platinum cheaply in March when the price was really, really low. Uh, and they're now increasing the sales of platinum and, and making money because the gold price uh, reduced their gold sales. So instantly in China, there's a good story. And then obviously we come on to the other fundamentals of platinum. So uh, certainly uh, a good topic for this, uh, for this uh, conference and, and much greater awareness uh, of platinum in China. So I just wanted to clarify, so the buses and trucks in Shanghai are already battery electric vehicles. I thought that the batteries would be a little bit heavy for all that and that the payload would be low. And, and you're saying then in the north, they're considering more um, the, the use of hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah, that's correct, Martin. So, you know, again, to, to make a, tr a truck, a haulage truck uh, that, that is battery driven is very hard and it's where the fuel cell um, uh, truck has a, a huge advantage. So there's lots of examples, uh, you know, particularly in Switzerland, where they're now using uh, fuel cell trucks to, to move groceries around uh, and have a zero emissions vehicle. And that's working quite well to build out that fueling infrastructure. You, you need about 700 cars 
to make a hydrogen station uh, viable economically, but you only need about 27 trucks. So what it means is if you've got a, a small truck fleet, uh, the truck fleet can afford to put the hydrogen refueling in place. And that's good for governments that don't want to spend money on infrastructure, and particularly for battery infrastructure. But to your question, um, the, the, the municipal trucks, uh, small three to six ton trucks uh, in, in Chinese cities are battery electric, uh, they are quite efficient. And remember, those are all depot based. Uh, they go to the depot overnight and they recharge. And in, a, in, a, in those large uh, Chinese cities, planning was quite easy. They could put infrastructure in place when they were building, they were expanding, they had a lot of money. So you've got a, a city that had very good infrastructure. Uh, to go and retrofit a European city and provide that same kind of infrastructure has been much, much harder. And that's perhaps why we haven't seen battery uh, you know, expand as much uh, in Europe. Uh, but certainly uh, China wants to expand fuel cells strongly, uh, particularly into the north where, where I said it's cold and a lot of solar and wind. So they're going ahead on a two stream. You've got the battery electric vehicles still being produced and put through. And now you've got the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles also coming through. Would, would those be in the heavier tonnages or is it across the board? The battery electric vehicle had a big boost. Uh, diesel gate meant that a lot of the automakers said that they would then focus on battery. There's been a very strong push in the EU for battery and certainly battery will grow. Uh, you know, it hasn't grown as much as everybody wanted. It's grown from maybe um, you know, two percent to five percent, and that's great growth. But you've heard Martin all these uh, comments about banning internal combustion engines from various cities from 2040 or 2030. The problem is, if you ban internal combustion and you have to run on battery, then your power grid is just too small uh, to charge all those vehicles. So it's really not feasible to ban um, internal combustion engines so soon. And battery is a massive drain on on the electricity, and and equally. To get a hydrogen infrastructure up in 10 years, that's also re really too, too quick and too costly to governments. So my view is that those bans are going to have to include hybrid vehicles. And we do know that a, that a mild hybrid diesel vehicle emits 35% less CO2 than a conventional gasoline engine. So very good for platinum is that, uh, you know, as the funding from COVID has sapped government funding, that the transition between internal combustion and, and electric vehicles has been slowed down. And that puts a big focus on that internal combustion tail. And that's very good for platinum because of the huge advantage of the, of the mild hybrid diesel. Uh, so certainly um, good strong developments for platinum. And we will have, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20, maybe even 25% battery electric vehicles over time. The heavy duty fuel cells are likely to be the short term demand. But in, you know, 10, 15 years time, there'll be a big chunk of battery, a big chunk of fuel cell and certainly uh, a tale of very CO2 efficient, um, hopefully mild hybrid diesels on the road at that stage. And Trevor, what other news on platinum and platinum group metals is important to communicate right now? And I think thinking about, about a discussion, we've covered a lot of them, but I think the important one is that the price at the moment, investment demand is interesting, but I think this discussion about the, the hydrogen economy, if you think back a year, the hydrogen economy was almost spoken about as a science project. I think what COVID has done is it's made the hydrogen economy an absolute certainty and a reality that will be rolled out in that five to 10 year period. So a lot of investors that weren't aware of platinum's strategic role in the hydrogen economy have turned to look at platinum as a potential place to invest. When they do, they don't see a lot of platinum demand growth for hydrogen because that's only a small little bit of heavy duty truck in the short term. But what they see is a market that is in huge deficit, uh, that there's a lot of interest in and, and is you know, at a price that's extremely uh, deeply discounted to both gold and palladium. Uh, the amount of substitution that's likely to occur is high. There's likely to be more diesel cars on the road in Europe because of the, the big CO2 fines. So a lot of investors are hearing about the hydrogen economy, looking at platinum and then finding a very in interesting uh, opportunity and investing in platinum. So the short term uh, consequence of that hydrogen economy is more investment demand. And we're forecasting 600,000 ounces of bar and coin demand. And those are, those are the man in the street that are actually paying, in a lot of cases, a premium for a bar and a coin, and they're paying VAT on top of it. They tend to hold those bars and coins for a long time, and that's really good for, for sticky demand. And in addition, we're finding more and more investors that have never owned platinum, they've owned gold, suddenly owning platinum. So I think the developments that we've discussed uh, today, Martin, are certainly uh, driving strong investment demand and uh, yeah, good for this metal that is precious to South Africa indeed and, and to you and me. That was Crema Media's Mining Weekly speaking to Trevor Raymond, the Director of Research for the World Platinum Investment Council.